Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Onco Daily and the Onco Influencers. And uh, today we are privileged to host um, uh, Dr. Lillian Su, the president elect of the American Association for Cancer Research. Um, I have two pages of her background. It's going to be like long list to read about her background. And she's very well known in the field of uh, oncology and cancer research for many years with her uh, incredible work. But let me just shortly read her bio for those people who haven't had a chance to, to read it. Um, Dr. Uh, Sue is the fellow of the American Association of Cancer Research Academy. And uh, just recently by the members of AACR, she was elected as a president, as I mentioned, uh, and she's going to assume the presidency in April. Right, if I'm not mistaken. President-elect in April. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, Dr. Siu is a senior medical oncologist and director of phase one clinical trials program, uh, co-director of the Robert and Maggie Brass and family drug development program, clinical lead for the tumor immunotherapy program and the, the BMO chair in precision cancer genomics at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, University Health Network in Toronto, Canada. She's also a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Uh, she had, I mean, I cannot read everything. That's why I'm going to skip some of the parts. And um, doctors, uh, uh, Dr. Sue has been a member of the ASCR since 1996 and was recently elected as a fellow of ASCR Academy, as I mentioned. She has greatly contributed to the growth of ASCR through her leadership and involvement with numerous AACR committees and association groups. She's a member of AACR International Canada Board of Directors and AACR Finance and Audit Committee and former member of AACR Board of Directors. Uh, she has been invaluable in shaping AACR annual meetings by serving a co-chair in 2016-2012 and a member of the annual meeting program committee, co-chair and member of the annual meeting clinical trials committee and chair and member of the annual meeting Education Committee. She will serve as the chair of the 2025 Annual Meeting Program Committee. And um, she, is, uh, she was also the co-chair of AACR Special Conference in Cancer Research, Advancing Precision Medicine Drug Development, and co-chair and faculty member of AACR ASCO Methods in Clinical Cancer Research Workshop. Uh, Dr. Sue has provided important guidance as a member of AACR Asian, Asian American Task Force since 2023 up to now, Clinical Trials Advisory Council, International Affairs Committee, Regional Advisory Committee on Canada, uh, and uh, Women in Cancer Research Council, Clinical and Translational Cancer Research Grants Committee, Henry Shepard Bladder Cancer Research Grant Scientific Review Committee, and International Membership Committee. And uh, she got a lot of awards. Uh, she has a lot of distinct, uh, distinguished uh, uh, distinctions and um, she has supported the ACR Scientific Achievement Awards program by serving as a member of the ACR Wang Ki Hong Award for Outstanding Achievement in Cancer Research Committee. She was a member of the nominating committee, chair of the London Foundation AACR Innovation Award for International Collaboration in Cancer Research Committee, and member of the AACR Women in Cancer Research Charlotte Friend Memorial Lectureship Award. And um, she has been recognized, as I mentioned, numerous awards throughout her career, including Canadian Cancer Trials Group Maria Ricci Lectureship, the American Society of Clinical Oncology International Woman Who Conquered Cancer Mentorship Award in 2020, the European Society for Medical Oncology Targeted Anti-Cancer Therapies Honorary Award, University of Toronto Michael Hutchin Mentor Award, Eton Research Scholars Research of the Year, L.C. Winfred Cran Memorial Trust Award in Medical Research and National Cancer Institute Michael Christian Oncology Development Lectureship and Award. She's elected fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and American Society of Clinical Oncology. And she was also among 100 influential women in oncology by Onco Daily. Uh, I'm sure if I uh, continue reading, it's going to be like another 20 minutes of reading, but let's come to our interview. Uh, and Dr. Sue, uh, congratulations with your election and thank you so much for having the time to be interviewed by Onco Daily. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Gavon. Uh, it's an honor. 
Uh, my pleasure and honor. You have been at the forefront of oncology drug development for over two decades. So what was initially your motivation? What motivated you to be involved in this field and how has that patient uh, evolved over the years? Yeah, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this interview. Um, I think it is a very interesting um, channel and I hope uh, I can share some of my experience and my thoughts with you all. Um, I became a medical oncologist in the mid 1990s. And as you have noted, it's been several decades. So uh, I love my job, which is a fortunate uh, thing for me in my life. I get up in the morning, I wanna go to work every day. And I think that's a good sign. Uh, what motivated me, I think, Obviously, many of us have had experiences in our friends and family, and I'm no exception. I have family members who had cancer, and um, even as a young student in university and medical student, oncology was always a very attractive field because I really feel that I can you know, contribute to fight a disease that has still a lot of you know, questions to be solved. Um, I went into drug development mainly because I find this field fascinating. Um, there is so much to learn, and every day we have new science that leads to new treatment options and new compounds that can be developed. And when I was doing my training, I somewhat stumbled into a fellowship in new drug development and phase one clinical trials, and I really was not specifically looking for such a fellowship. But when I saw this actually advertisement, uh, I thought it was really my calling and I'm glad my intuition was right. And I subsequently pursued um, fellowship in new drug development and uh, haven't looked back since. Uh, so you started um... Your medical degree at, uh, I mean, you completed your medical degree at the University of Toronto, and now you became the a AACR president-elect, one of the largest organizations in the world. Um, like, if we go back, can you reflect on a, on the moment, pivotal moment, or mentorship experience during your early career that helped shape your path in oncology, uh, drug development, and also translational research? I don't think I can limit it to one experience. I was very lucky and fortunate to have many good mentors in my career. Um, I would just name a few. Um, when I was in Toronto doing my training, I work with Malcolm Moore, Ian Tannick, who are well-renowned oncologists in experimental therapeutics in gastrointestinal cancers, pancreatic cancer for Malcolm Moore, Ian Tannick, also in a similar field in head neck cancer, and also obviously in clinical trials methodology. And that sort of got me started in the area of research that I knew I was interested to pursue. And I mentioned that I subsequently pursued a fellowship uh, in San Antonio, Texas, in uh, early drug development under the uh, uh, mentorship of Dr. Gail Eckhart, Dr. Eric Wawinski, and Dr. Dan Von Hoff, and the San Antonio team, which um, really has been at that uh, time the world leader in early drug development, specifically phase one trials. And it opened my eyes in terms of what drug development can be like. And, and I think there are so many experiences from my mentors that reinforce that point that it is the field that I want to pursue as a career. And uh, I think it has been a very enjoyable and um, uh, fun experience to, to take on, you know, 20 plus, almost 30 years of new drug development as a career path. Uh, I, I was going to ask you, so I think that's the time to ask, uh, like, uh... Uh, who was a role model or who is a role model for you as a as a oncologist as a physician and as a scientist i think the ones that i've mentioned are obviously i have had a lot of great mentors who really want to focus as much on 
my career and their mentee's career and not just their career, which I think is very important. And I've learned that also from them, how to be a good mentor, that you need to put their career first before yours. And, you know, I think it's important that there are people like that in the field that think about the young investigators, the early career investigators. And certainly my mentors have done that for me, you know, opportunities that they allow, you know, myself to be on the podium to give a talk, to be first author for a paper that, you know, they help guide me through. And obviously think of ideas um, that I can do projects on and then stimulate me to help me think of ideas on my own. And I think that's very important to help create original thinking or stimulate original thinking. Because I think a lot of mentees and, and trainers or trainees are, are very good in carrying out projects given to them from their instructors, from their mentors. But really training them to think originally on their own, to come up with original thoughts that are of interest is really an important goal as a mentorship, for mentorship. So to answer your question, I think many of them are, I've highlighted, you know, Malcolm Moore, Ian Tanney, Gail Eckhart as really the key mentors in my career path. I mean, that's very important. And just like two days ago, we we're talking with uh, with Richard Sullivan and I was asking, I mean, I said, I really need your help. We, we need to send some of our, like we have really brilliant uh, young doctors and uh, to send outside to some centers where they would have this out of box thinking kind of mentorship. Because I mean, I, I it really, I agree with you that like, um, it all, I mean, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, right? And the 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 way um, the our career and our uh, like thinking, the way of we think will be shaped. It will depend on what we see. Like if we follow someone, a mentor who is inno in, 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 has an innovative thinking, then certainly, I mean, we are going to adapt that kind of uh, style of thinking. So that's I agree with you. Very very important, but. Besides that, I mean, besides the uh, the scientific part, also uh, for for a physician, for an oncologist uh, especially, I mean, what are the main qualities you think the the major qualities nowadays? What do you think? What's the most important to be an oncologist? I think at the end of the day, we're doctors. At the end of the day, no matter what field we are in, we are physicians. We give care. And the most important person for us, it's our patients. There is no question about that. And I think, you know, I, I, despite how busy my research career takes me, that's the part of my career I would never want to give up. Um, some of my junior faculty and I actually had a recent conversation and said, as you get busier and busier in your academic career, are you going to give up your practice? And I hope not. I mean, I think that is a part of me that I would not have gone into oncology if I just want to be, you know, doing academic work and research without seeing patients. It it helps me understand, you know, why this field is important. Um, obviously, I, I see patients, you know, not always successful with their treatments. Some are, and that's very rewarding and gratifying. But helping them through the most difficult part of their journey, to me, has really been an important message that I want to, you know, always remind myself on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and you know, a smaller part of my week now is taking care of patients. A bigger part is doing my research and administrative duties. But even that little small part helped me to ground, to make sure I, I know why I'm doing what I'm doing every day. So I think that's the most important point for a physician. I, I always tell my, you know, junior investigators, before you're a good researcher, a good investigator, you have to be a good physician. You have to be a good doctor. Otherwise, it's meaningless. You know, whatever you do, it doesn't really bring it home. And, and you know, everything else will come if you are able to look at your patient and know that you are giving them the best care you, you have in, in delivering such, you know, care. 
That's so true. I, I was reading a book that's in, in my hands recently. I mean, I mean it's in my hands now. It was telling the the name of the book is How Doctors Think by Jerome Groupman. And there, there was one expression from one of the doctors, Dr. Falchuk, he said, once you remove yourself from the patient's story, you are no longer uh, truly a doctor. That was that's so very true. true. Yeah. I, I cannot agree with more. And, and so, you know, I think that that daily experience or daily interaction with patients and their family really, you know, make the circle complete in terms of an investigator, a researcher, a scientist. That's so true. Uh, so when, while I was reading your bio, and um, I mean, as I mentioned, throughout your career, you have received so many awards and honors for your contributions in, uh, for cancer research and for patient care. Uh, and I mean, there were such, uh, awards which I would not, I was not able to pronounce. Hopefully, I mean, uh, my pronunciation was uh, okay. So, but looking back, uh, uh, is there a specific recognition or acknowledgement that stands out to you as this this significant milestone in your professional journey? Um, well, I want to thank all the organizations that have given me recognition. I mean. It's never my own work, it's always the team's work. Um, I'm just standing in front of a whole line of people that have supported you know, the research that our groups have been able to produce. If I have to choose one award that thus far have been most sort of important to me or, or means very much to me, as they all do, probably is my mentorship award um, as an international um, conqueror cancer yeah. um, award for mentorship. I think, you know, I think that is an award that a group of individuals who I have mentored nominated me for this election. Um, to me, that means I have probably done something right that they still consider me a friend and a mentor and, you know, enjoy the experience we've had and remember it and appreciated it. So. To me, that that is obviously a very meaningful award that is not just about scientific achievements. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Su, in one of your interviews, you mentioned that during your training, drug development was a relatively new field. How do you perceive the evaluation of this field now? And what are your reflections on the current state of drug development in oncology? That's an interesting question. So when I was training in the mid 90s, we only had cytotoxic chemotherapy. And, you know, I was doing a fellowship in drug development and we were running out of cytotoxic agents. You know, there was not a lot more to develop because most of the cytotoxins, whatever mechanism, I think the microtubulars were fairly new at that time the taxanes and, and other antimicrotubular, but there weren't a lot more targets to develop with cytotoxins. And then the molecularly targeted drugs came, you know, that became, you know, an eye opener. We're talking about precision medicine, sequencing tumors to find molecular drivers. And the science came along. It was very exciting. And then, you know, maybe oncogenes are exhausted. We can only target so many oncogenes and it's not easy to activate tumor suppressors back. So if we hit all the oncogenes and all the kinases, we're done again in terms of drug development. Then of course, the whole era of immunotherapy opened up and wow, what a game changer, right? We now actually are not targeting the tumor cells with our drugs. We're actually targeting the immune system with our drugs and other means. And that opened a whole new chapter, a whole new pillar of oncotherapeutics and so on and so forth. We have antibody drug conjugates coming, bispecifics, cell therapies. So I guess my learning from drug development is it's not over until it's over and it may never be over. And, and you know, every day you learn and you find that you can find something else from our bench scientists that can bring ultimately brought to the clinic to help us, you know, improve the care and cure of our patients. So I think the field is just 
about to start more and I don't think it's actually ending and and which is a good thing for our patients because every day we want new hope, we want new treatments and we want new discoveries. And certainly I think we are continuing to understand more about this disease. So I, I think the, the drug development field continues to grow and, and learn. And that's our duty to try and understand more. Uh, someone deeply committed to mentorship and education I mean, while we were talking all the time, you were mentioning about, uh, I mean, mentioning about the mentors and stressing on the mentorship and education. What advice would you offer to early career oncologists or researchers navigating this, uh, this through the complexities of academia and clinical practice? And I mean, what would be your advice to become successful in both in science as well as in patient care? One of the most important element is curiosity. I mean, if we always take everything we are taught for granted, it's very hard to change and improve the field. So I think I would always wanna keep a curious mind and ask. And you sort of need a bit of time every day at the end of the day to think about what you've learned today that you think sounds right or you think that doesn't sound quite right. Why is it that way? And what can I do further to understand it more? It sort of need that space in your mind to have that clear thinking. And you know, it could be just 15 minutes, 30 minutes at the end of the day to reflect upon what you have heard, what you have seen today to understand more what could be asked. I think curiosity is a very, very powerful tool. I would say also for, for me, I believe that being tenacious is important. Um, being sort of don't give up easily. And and I'm I'm very I'm I've been told I'm very tenacious. I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I don't give up easily. I, I don't believe that there are impossible tasks uh by and large. And I think the perseverance, the tenacity is the tenacity is an important way to succeed because if you have the will, you probably will find a way to solve a problem and maybe not completely, but at least partially. And I would say those are my two key recommendations, curiosity and tenacity. Uh, what is leadership for you? Leadership is to stand behind your team, not in front of them, to me. And it sounds like a cliche, but it is not. I think, you know, no team is one person and no leader is one person. And I have been very fortunate to build a lot of groups, a lot of teams. And I really, really enjoy having meetings where, you know, everybody contribute, everybody has a voice. Um, we have a regular phase one meeting in our institute every week. I lead the phase one clinical trials program. And we have opportunities, we go through trials, we go through you know options for various patients, but we want everybody to have the ability to speak up. It used to be in person, now is virtual, like most meetings are. And you know, and as we go through the different clinical trials or cases, I encourage everybody to speak up. In fact, we have a, a few sort of additional items that we do is every week we take turns, somebody talk a bit about themselves, not just about you know their work. They talk a little bit about where they're from, you know, their background. So we get to know each other. We also started something new is really everybody takes turn to pick a topic. They teach us. It doesn't have to be science. I think the next week's topic that we're going to learn is about AI. And one of the coordinators is going to talk to us what she thinks that AI means in oncology as a, you know, scientific, uh, as a coordinator for a, a clinical trial. So we want everybody to have a voice. So I think leadership really is to allow the 
individuals that are working, who are working with you to be able to contribute, to feel that they are part of it. And I think that has been very useful for me as a way to run teams that are successful. And, and obviously I think it's important, as I mentioned earlier, if you're gonna be, if we're gonna be helping younger investigators to develop their career, we need to give them the opportunity to think and to grow and let them, you know, lead. And, and I think that's that's very important as a leader because we 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 won't all be in our prime. <laughs> There's only a certain amount of time in your life that you can be in the prime of your career. So one of the most successful things for somebody to do is to create enough um, training of the next generation that they can look back and say, you know, I have successfully trained these individuals who are now world leaders. Um, you mentioned AI and AI in oncology. What's your opinion about it? What's going to be future there? I mean, what's there going to be the role for AI in, in oncology in the future? Yeah, I wish I know the answer. And I know there are, you know, people who totally believe in it. And there are people that feel this is just, you know, yet another buzzword that uh, people use right now. Whenever you have a question that you cannot solve, you say AI will help us solve it in due time. I actually do think there are situations where AI will help us in oncology, certainly in digital pathology, that has made a, a, a big game changer. Radiation, for example, planning. I think, I hope as a drug developer, AI, machine learning, computational biology will help us understand how the cancer changes over time, how to select right drug combinations for patients. To us, I think those are still unsolved challenges. You know, cancers change much faster than we can predict. And if we have the right tools, the right models, and the right machine learning algorithms, perhaps we can actually preempt and predict what will happen, um, whether it be, you know, digital twin method or other methodology, I don't know. But to be able to able to preempt what the cancers will do to evolve would be very helpful. And as I said, drug combinations is not easy to give five, six drugs together um, because of toxicity. And perhaps there are ways we can understand through multi-omic biomarkers that we can actually create the right regimens for patients that are not um, toxic or at least acceptable in terms of toxicity, but able to target multiple vulnerabilities at the same time. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, then there was something like during the COVID, right? When Barasatinib was uh, like uh, through the AI, uh, just stabbing with his team, they found out that it it's my, it might work in the COVID and they then it, it really worked. So, I mean, maybe also for the repurposing the drugs, right? I mean, because Hopefully. we have so many drugs on the shelves and we, maybe we are not using them correctly. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think for every new tool, there's always a bit of a learning at the beginning and there's always a hype at the beginning, but I think it all, eventually we will find the right place for it and the right setting for it. Yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, I'm sure you are so busy with the patient care, with research, with your leadership roles and, but, um, I mean, it's a, it's a very like uh, I mean, everyone likes to ask this question, but uh, I, I'm I'm going to ask again. Uh, how do you find the work life balance? And I mean, what do you enjoy outside of the your work? Yeah, I I I'm not a great model for work life balance because I'm always the first one to come to the office, and I'm usually the last one who leaves. Uh, and I'm here a lot on the weekends to catch up. So if I tell you that I have a 50-50 work-life balance, I am not telling you the truth. So I'm not going to do that on a recording. I'm going to tell you that I try and I'm actually making a conscious effort to do that. My colleague and I, for example, sign up for uh, kickboxing, which oh. I have started. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's actually, you know, fun because we get to, you know, 
do some training and exercise at the same time, you know, it keeps your mind fresh because during that time you, you can do a lot of thinking and relief of your stress. So I think that's fun. Um, I also enjoy travel besides work travel, <laughs> which already is a lot, but I try to do some pleasure travel as well. Uh, I wish I had more time to read. I, I try, but not as much as I would like to. But I am, I'm still trying to reach a good work-life balance. Obviously, I have my family, and uh, I spend time with, with them as well, as much as I can. Uh, so you mentioned traveling. What's your most favorite destination to travel? Yeah, I... We, my husband and I, really like. There's a, a city, Carmel by the Sea in California, close to San Francisco. We drive there. We have a house there. Um, it's a small but very quaint town. There's ocean. There's a beach. There is actually a, a restaurant, a ranch, that is actually Clint. Eastwood's Ranch, Mission Ranch, and they have sheep there. And one of the songs that my husband and I like to hear is that sheep can graze safely here. And truly, it does feel that. You can sit there, look back, the whole field with sheep, and, you know, all your troubles are gone. You know, all the papers and all the projects and all the grants that you're worried about can at least stop for about 30, 40 minutes during that time and just watch the sheep's grace. I wish I can do that every day and all day, but I can. But even if I can do it sometime every few months, I think it's a, it's a good recharge mechanism. Uh, and what's on your to-do list for the traveling? I have a lot of business travel this year, so I don't know yet what my pleasure travel will be probably at the end of the year. I I may just stay home, to be honest. That might be my best travel place destination. <laughs> <laughs> it's sometimes easier and relaxed at home when you don't have a lot of chances to stay home. Uh, by the way, um, I mean, I'll be very happy to see you in Armenia. So please put on your calendar or put on your to-do list and we I can have never been organize. so you're going to like it we can discuss when you have time to come so thank you certainly. one of my best friend in medical school is Armenian so who, who is that he's a GI uh, gastroenterologist in Toronto okay we have some Armenians in Toronto <laughs> you have a big community <laughs> in Toronto yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, you mentioned also the books. Uh, what are, I mean, the top three books you would recommend every every oncologist to read? Um, the first one I would recommend is actually a book called The Art of Medicine. That's by Dr. Hoping Kong. He is one of the master clinician and master clinician teachers in Toronto and Canada. He is very well known in our field. And he is a brilliant clinician. And you know, if you're reading that book, it's really a lot of vignettes about how he has mastered the art of medicine. And one of the chapters I love most is the art of listening. And I read that chapter a lot because I'm not very good at it. And the average time doctors give their patients to talk is 20 seconds before they jump in and interrupt. So I remind myself, read that chapter because you're not gonna get it right if you don't give them the time to listen. So that's number one. Um, the second one I would say is Blink by Malcolm, yeah. uh, Malcolm Blackwell. Blackwell. I think that's a very interesting book for oncologists because we make decisions at a snap second sometimes. Sometimes they're very right and sometimes we are wrong. And I like this idea of how impulsive decisions should be leveraged or should be toned down. And, you know, even sometimes when you make snap decisions because you have no choice, you have to look back and see, did I make that decision right? And I think the third one I would say is um, In Shock 
by um, a physician who has survived um, a catastrophe in her health. Um, she became a patient and she was able to survive and really write back about her experience as a patient and how doctors' words matter to patients when we speak, when we maybe not even thinking about what we're saying in the clinic, in front of them or in the clinic space, and how we can really, you know, make sure we have empathy and, and be able to listen and be able to put ourselves on the other side of, of the clinic space. Those would be my three top books, but I'm honest, I wish I can read more. Uh, by the chance, I don't know how, but by the chance, uh, I mean, the, the page which was just opened, it was saying, um, observers have noted that on average physicians interrupt patients within 18 seconds of when they begin telling their story. <laughs> <laughs> it is very true. And, and you know, you've got to check yourself and, okay, it's 20 seconds. Do not interrupt. They're trying to tell a story. Give them the time. But that was funny that that was the page which was just opened on on, on the book I was I was reading. Um, and uh, yeah, and I don't know who, but someone I think said that if you listen carefully, the patient, uh, he or she is telling uh, the diagnosis from the story already. I mean that I, I agree that that's really very important, but sometimes we are, I mean it's very impatient to to listen. Uh, and, See, uh, in you mentioned this quote, uh, Mark Twain's, Twain's uh, quote that the dictionary is the only place where success comes before work, as your motto. And it was in it. 2012. It was in 2012. Uh, 12 yeah, years ago. I, I still believe in that. Is that your a motto? motto? I do. I, as I heard earlier on, mentioned that. I, I actually enjoy working a lot. And uh, I also think that one has to invest in the effort to be successful. Luck plays a little part, I think, in everybody's lives. And, you know, you have to have the right mentor, you have to have the right job. But I think you do have to put enough effort and heart at it to, to be able to achieve your goal. And, you know, I think... I, I am fortunate that I enjoy my work. I don't find it difficult to do, you know, multiple projects and work at the same time. But I do believe that if you don't put in the work, it's very hard to expect a good result. And and I like to set examples for people I work with because, you know, I, I, when I tell them you need to invest some time, you also have to demonstrate that you do the same because otherwise it's just hypocritical, right? So I do believe work has to come before success. Yeah, that's true. Uh, how being a member of AACR has supported your career uh, and growth as a scientist? Yeah, I think I've been a member for ACR for a long, long time, uh, all the way from my training days, which is many years ago. It has been, and I've attended many, many AACR meetings and will continue to do so. I think the membership of being an AACR um, constituent and a member is to allow me to have the cross talk, the opportunities to meet basic scientists, fundamental scientists, translational scientists at meetings and other venues to really able to exchange ideas. Of course, I understand a lot of the clinical side and how to do clinical trials. But I don't have a lot of knowledge or background on some of the important mechanisms to the point that they do. And I think that exchange has allowed me to open up my mind a lot, you know, and to achieve a lot more than I, if I were just to do things on my own, within my own, you know, institution, in my own project. So having the ability to cross talk with different disciplines, meeting them in meetings, Obviously, you know, there are a lot of journals. I'm one of the co-editor-in-chief for one of the AACR journals. And having the ability to submit manuscripts and have feedback from your reviewers from, you know, different disciplines, again, help you understand 
beyond what you're thinking in your own mind, which by definition is limited, right? Because nobody can think of everything. So I think having the ability to have access to different fields and really communicate with them and understand more of the deeper science really has enabled me to be a more well-rounded investigator. Uh, thank you. And you are the director of phase one unit, right? So, I mean, you know how, how it works. And I mean, what would be your advice for someone who wants to establish one, a phase one unit? I have trained many individuals who ask that question. Um, I would say, if you don't have the training, you need to find a program to do formal training. Um, I went to San Antonio, I mentioned, and I trained with the world leaders in that field 30 years ago. And we have a program that also trains young oncologists interested to develop early phase drug development programs. We on average train about six to eight um, individuals who come here usually for two to three years. I think it's important to actually learn from experiences outside of your own teams, or your own institution, and perhaps your own country. Um, obviously, keeping up with the field, uh, attend meetings, read journals, do all the right things to improve your knowledge base. But I think the networking is important. I, I, I find that during my fellowship, I made a lot of friends and they have become lifelong friends. And friends introduced me to friends and meetings. I also meet new, you know, connections. I make new connections. That to me is is as important as my training in this field. So, networking, knowledge increased by reading and going to conferences, and also training. Uh, what's the most important in networking? The most important in networking is to be sincere and to be humble. I think I find sometimes in networking, you know, everybody wants to say, I just discovered this. I just wrote this. I tend to be a listener at the beginning and listen to what people have done instead of telling them what I have done. And I think, you know, again, the art of listening is important and really understand what others have done that you can either contribute or add and maybe even, you know, join forces to do something together. And I think being humble is really important to, to you know, create a friendship that uh, can last. And being a good listener and being a collaborator is important. You know, not every project I'm going to lead and not every project uh, I will be successful. But sometimes projects are better when you are only a contributor. Because after you contribute, the next one maybe you will lead, and next, and they will be willing to participate. Your your teammates. So I think it's important to have that kind of balance. Um, thank you very much. Um, one last question. Uh, Going to be the toughest one. No, no, no. <laughs> or maybe. Uh, who should we interview next? A <laughs> very interesting question. Wow, that's a really tough question. Does it have to be an oncologist? No, but if, I mean, if we don't know them, then I would ask you to connect them to, to interview. Of course, no. That's a very interesting question. Do you, did you ask that before you interview me? No, no. You are the first one I'm asking this question. Just it came uh... to me. The first one I would come to my mind, and he may not know this, I would say is Dr. Passiani at Dana-Farber. He's a good friend of mine, and he knows a lot about basic and translational science in lung cancer. Uh, Passi and I are very good friends, and I also always enjoy talking to him. So I would say he would be the one I would suggest you go next. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to drop an email. <laughs> That's Thank totally so on the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It was really so interesting for me and so educational also and so inspiring.
thank you very much for all the work you have done and you are doing. And I'm sure there is a lot you are going to do and accomplish in the years to come. And thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, Gavork. It's a it's a pleasure. I uh, I enjoy the hour went by so fast. Thank you. Me too. Thank you very much.